So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, February monthly network meeting for Farm to School Vancouver Area Hub. My name is Samantha Gambling. I'm the community animator for the Vancouver Area Hub, which means that I'm here to network and I'm here to support schools and community partners who are engaged with Farm to School activities or who want to start some Farm to School programming um, at schools in Vancouver and on the North Shore. Uh, I want to take a brief moment to recognize that wherever you're sitting right now, we're all here sitting on unceded Coast Salish territory. And I think this is especially important to uh, recognize when we're educating students about growing food, um, because most of the food that we're growing on this unceded land is not indigenous to the fire region or to Coast Salish culture. Uh, and I think that's an important um, recognition to incorporate into conversations around farm to school teachings. Um, Today, I'm really excited to be hosting this meeting. I'm going to be introducing Carissa Casper in just a minute, uh, who's going to be sharing all of her secrets and resources on how to plan and prepare for uh, your spring school garden. Um, and now that all the snow is finally gone uh, and we can actually see things popping up, this is a relevant conversation. So I'm really glad to have her here with us. Um, and before I introduce Carissa, I just want to make a couple notes about the Zoom meeting program that we're using. Uh, so as I mentioned, this video is being recorded and will be public publicly posted, so let me know if you have any issues with that. Um, as you can see, you're able to mute yourself. You can turn off your video if you don't want to interact. Um, but I recommend that you keep your video on if you can and that uh, you turn your microphone off while Chris is speaking and then so that we can see you. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, um, Carissa is going to take questions after her presentation. Uh, and you can also, I see that um, Chantal has already used the chat box. You can also use the chat box to indicate that you have a question and then um, Krista can call on you. Um, so if you have any problems with the platform, just send me a message through the chat box. You can click to send to everyone or you can choose just to send to me directly. So um, yeah, feel free to send me a message anytime throughout the presentation or the meeting. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carissa. Um, Carissa is the coordinator of Project Garden, which is an educational and social platform designed to support new uh, food growers. And Project Garden brings together leaders from local food community to offer tools for fun, easy growing success. Um, and now Carissa is going to take you through some of the online and in-person resources that, that can help you succeed in your spring school garden project, um, all the way from planting to harvesting. So, Without further ado, Carissa, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about um, gardening in the school. Um, so I'm so excited to hear that you guys are interested in getting that going in your own schools. And um, I'd love to just share with you kind of a breakdown of how you can go about um, making that happen. Um, so today we have, there's um, a, just to kind of do a roll call, we have Addie, Chantel, and Jessica along with me here. Is that right? Okay. So um, let's just kind of go over the basics and start with what you might um, be, be considering when you're um, doing your planning. So um, I'd like to start kind of with infrastructure and think of, um, pose some of those questions to you so you can start kind of engaging and thinking about it and provide you with some resources that might help you um, with that level of planning. So kind of first thing to think about with infrastructure is, um, where you want the garden to be. So first important step is of course the sun. So um, veggie gardens take, um, most veggies take six to eight hours of full sun exposure. So um, getting, uh, thinking of where that's going to be, um, if you have less than that for sun, you can still grow edible food, but um, generally I would recommend um, you to maybe think about a medicinal garden if you have a site that um, you definitely want it to be, but it doesn't get that amount of sun. You also want to think about um, placement in terms of traffic. Is, there, is this a place where during off school hours there's a bunch of dogs running through? Maybe you want to reconsider the placement. Um, the size, what kind of size are you working with in the school? 
Um, visibility, you want to engage the community and the school in this um, kind of school garden and get people on board. Um, so, but you also want to prevent kind of um, too much traffic from going on around the garden as well. So um, thinking about visibility, um, ease of use. So if you're coming out with your classroom, um, locating the garden near the school um, can definitely be a, a nice asset. Thinking about delivery, if once you're setting it up, you'll be hauling in some soil, um, bringing some plants. So um, a place that you don't have to carry those kind of supplies too far um, would definitely be beneficial. Um, you want to think about keeping away from dumpsters, bins, um, green spaces, um, just to kind of uh, keep the critters away from your um, growing food. So with all those kind of ideas in mind, um, then, and then, the, oh, sorry, I forgot, um, your water source. So thinking of where that is on a building, how you might um, kind of locate it so you're not hauling water to the site. Um, so then with all of those kind of questions in mind, um, there's two things to kind of think about. Are you going to plant earth gardens or are you going to do raised beds? So just talking about advantages and kind of ideas around that. So um, with your earth gardens, um, of course it's free. So if you have a place in the schoolyard that could be um, Convert it into an earth garden. That might be an easy, quick way to kind of get started. Um, we do, if you are considering that, you will want to consider um, adding soil amendments into um, the garden. So compost and manure are really good places to start and think about. Um, uh, other kind of considerations. So then the advantage of doing a raised bed instead. Um, is you get to start out with um, a quality kind of soil mix. Uh, potting mix is a good place to kind of begin. Um, and you don't have to start adding, um, uh, building your soil in the same way that you do in an earth garden over a period of years by adding amendments. Um, so it's kind of a quick start um, way to go. So, um, those are kind of some questions about infrastructure. So I'm just going to pause here and open. That's a lot of information at once. So I'm going to open it up to um, you guys to send uh, any questions around infrastructure that you may have. Uh, Carissa, maybe I can jump in here. This is Addy. Um, I'm just wondering, you said about the critters, and I hadn't really thought about compost. Like, how far should compost be kept away from the garden? Obviously, you don't want it too far, but... Sometimes we have mice problems in our compost. Yeah, so um, a, a good thing to think about that is what kind of compost kind of container that you're using. Of course, if it's something that's open um, and the critters can easily kind of get in and out, then it's a good idea to kind of place your garden as far as possible away from that kind of um, scenario. If you have a composting system that um, uh, is more contained. So one way to think about that is perhaps doing a uh, worm composting. So um, the city, uh, city farmer works in conjunction with um, the city of Vancouver with a great worm comp subsidized worm composter that's for small spaces. So it can go into your um, classroom. And uh, thinking about maybe dividing up kind of what you um, use in each. So your food scraps, if that's something that you guys already compost. Thinking about um, doing that maybe in the classroom and then keeping your outdoor composter, if it's already located near your school garden, um, and keeping that uh, just for kind of your garden debris sort of stuff. And that can be another way to kind of separate um, what's attracting the critters. Great, thank you. No problem. Okay, I just saw Chantel's um, question there. Um, so it says, we're just getting set up on site prep. We have a teacher who's willing to bring grade 12s to come build the boxes with our students, but we're looking to find untreated cedar to make these boxes. Do you have any ideas where to get some? We are a low income school and don't have much money for this project. 
That's a great question. Where do you get the materials for the infrastructure? So um, West Van uh, Secondary School, I believe it is, they have a program, a building program with their construction students where they actually mill um, up cedar. So that would be maybe a great place for you to start. Um, I don't have that info. I, um, on my kind of list of um, people, but I can definitely send that to you after. It's uh, West Vancouver ACIT program. I'm going to just put it in the chat here for you guys. And Greg Cormier leads that. Okay, you saw that there. Yeah, that would be a great person to get in touch with, and um, he might be able to help you out with the, the wood at um, cost. Any other questions right now about um, infrastructure? I, uh, I just wanted to add that um, if you are looking for certain materials, that would be a, like one maybe way to start would be to ask that question on the farm to school um, Vancouver area listserv because there's a lot of people on that site that may have excess materials or have sourced it themselves from various places so um, you could always yes just send out an email to the to the group and you may have some uh, some somebody bite there awesome thank yeah. you um, if you have kind of want to dig into the infrastructure, so I'm not sure where you guys are at it um, in your schoolyard programs. It sounds like, Chantel, you're just gearing up to build one. And Addie, perhaps you guys already have a school garden. It's very beginning. Like we just have a couple of beds in. Uh, but that was actually my next question. Maybe this yeah. will help Chantal as well. If there's a particular size of garden bed that works like we don't want it too wide obviously right so you can reach in from all the sides but I'm wondering right now on the height because you kind of like what's the ideal depth maybe you want like the length of a carrot or something so that it doesn't hit the kind of rocky soil underneath it maybe you have some ideas around that that's a great question and I'm glad that you brought it up so um with when you're kind of designing raised beds um, and thinking about depth and how much you kind of want to grow in a small space, um, thinking about uh, the garden in terms of square feet is a really good starting point. So if you have wood that is raised um, a square feet off the ground and you're planting you're in a, with the square foot gardening method um, and breaking down your garden in that way, um, then each kind of square foot is going to leave a foot of planting depth, which is a good kind of standard to go with um, for most veggies. There are some veggies that have a um, larger depth like potatoes, which then you might want to um, consider growing outside of kind of your primary raised beds. Does that answer your question, Addie? That's perfect. I just, I'm just, uh, we only have it like a two by four width high. So I'm just like, oh, we have to do more, but that's good. Thank you. Two by four. Yeah. Perfect. Um, uh, okay, I am going to just share some uh, infrastructure resources that um, if you kind of want to dig into after, they're there for you. So um, Vancouver School Board Garden Policy, um, if you're just like in the very beginning stages, it's a good place to look. Um, the Spec School Gardens Program is another great resource for getting started. Um, Life Space, who is a part of Project Garden, one of our partners, um, we do a self-watering garden, which is, um, and this particular design is kind of our school um, garden option. Um, so it helps if you uh, want to kind of continue growing through the summer, but you don't have anybody there to um, take care of it. So it helps kind of with the watering piece. So those are kind of some infrastructure resources to dig into. So, um, I'm glad that you kind of, Addie, brought up 
uh, the, the depth and kind of size of the raised beds. Um, because I'd like to kind of talk to you guys about um, the next step. So you have your infrastructure in place. What are you going to plant? So um, two kind of things to consider. If you're doing raised beds, then you should be gardening um, with the square foot gardening method. So what that basically means, um, and I'm not sure if, you're, if you guys are familiar with it or not, but I'll um, kind of just go through it anyway for the video's sake. So square foot gardening is a method of gardening for small spaces. Instead of having rows in between your vegetables, you envision your garden in terms of squares. So you, um, you eliminate the rows because you don't need them. The purpose of them is, uh, the purpose of rows is just for you to be able to have access to all your veggies in a traditional earth garden. If you um, have access to your veggies, as you said, um, you're not making it too wide, which is kind of the rule of thumb is four square feet. You can reach in at all sides. That means that you don't need rows to access your veggies. That means you can plant things closer together and you can grow more in a small space. There's a lot of advantages to that beyond just being able to grow more in a small space. The primary one in my mind, and especially for school gardens, is it cuts down on your maintenance hugely. So um, you're not really leaving space for re weeds to grow. Um, generally, you'll be starting with kind of a potting mix to begin, so um, you're not carrying uh, the, like the soil and the earth will have weed seeds in it already. So starting with a potting mix kind of, you know, gets you off to a head start. Um, and then uh, by planting close together, you're just not leaving room for the weeds to kind of um, establish themselves. So your maintenance goes way down. It also um, uses a lot less resources. Um, your watering especially so. Um, that said, if you if Earth Garden kind of we went through infrastructure and why you might choose different um, options, if Earth Garden is the best option for your school, then um, uh, then definitely implementing the use of mulch, which is um, I advocate using leaves, um, dry grass or straw. Um, in between your rows will help you accomplish those same things. It will take down the um, level of weeds and will um, help you conserve water. So that's the kind of next step after infrastructure is just how are you actually going to grow um, so that you're not going to have to do a lot of maintenance. So those are kind of your two um, keys, square foot gardening and the use of mulch. So, um, with that said, here's a really good resource on square foot gardening. It's a website, and there's a book um, by Mel Bartholomew um, uh, around that. So, if you want to learn more about the concept of square foot gardening, that's a great start. I also have a video up on the Project Garden website. Um, uh, which I'll share with you here. Which is um, just explaining the concept of square foot gardening and the advantages of doing it. Okay, so do we have any questions about square foot gardening? Is that a term you guys are familiar with or would you like some more information about? I think uh, Chantal had a question there. Oh, thanks. Is square foot gardening the most common technique for schools? I'm not sure if I would necessarily say that it's the most common technique. In Vancouver, certainly using raised beds in schools is, is quite popular, often because we don't always have the best soil. Um, so, and we get so much rain. So it provides better drainage. Um, like I said, it just helps you get off um, the hop kind of with uh, a good quality soil mix. And um, yeah, but not everybody uses uh, the square foot gardening technique. They might still plant rows in a raised bed. Um, to me, I'm about kind of conserving the resources and getting the most out of a small space. So that's why I really recommend the square foot gardening kind of method. So 
yeah, definitely check out my video that I kind of um, explain that more in depth. And then if you want further information from there, the square foot gardening book is absolutely hands down your best kind of resource to go to. Carissa, are you going to, um, are you able to show us your website using the share screen or is that something you're going to do later on? Um, uh, yeah, let's get into the website because that's a great idea. So um, I'm just going to share my screen with you guys and I'll walk you through kind of the project garden, how it utilizes um, the square foot gardening technique. It might give you a bit more of a picture of that and um, uh, how the plans kind of work. So I'll just bring it up here. Okay. So this is Project Garden. It's a new website that we're launching on February 26. So um, keep an eye on it. We're going to be um, updating it um, in the next week and kind of launching it at the BC Home and Garden Show. So what it is, is this a, a educational video and social platform. And uh, so we have it kind of broken down into um, vegetables. You choose your veggie that you're interested in growing. And there's a video about how to plant, how to harvest, and um, how to care if there's a particular um, uh, way to prune, et cetera, it'll be there. So um, uh, to make it kind of even easier for you guys, so I'll show you one of the videos just to give you a clue. So this is our how to plant Swiss chard video. Swiss chard can be planted by seed or seedling. For faster results, choose seedlings. Space chard four per square foot. Squeeze the transplant from its cell, gently breaking each seedling apart. Dig holes the depth of the transplant. Place one seedling per spacing. Cover the roots with soil, firming up around the stem until the chard stands tall. Top water daily for one week. And it's easy growing. So that's the basic idea of um, the videos. They're all quick, kind of under a minute long and just very focused on the task at hand. So how to plant, that's all you need to know then. Then later on, um, how do I prune this thing? That's there for you and then when it comes time to harvest. So, um, so basically we don't wanna overwhelm people, just kind of bite-sized um, pieces. So to kind of make it even um, easier, I have, oops, I've put together plants for um, how to plant. So these are based around the square foot gardening method that we we're talking about. Um, so you choose kind of the size of garden that you're designing. So the one by three, three by three, four by four, kind of all standard um, raised bed sizes. To, depending on the size of your um, space. And then uh, we're offering up a PDF kind of planting plan that is uh, for download here. It's just taking a second. Here we are. Okay, so this is the square foot kind of planting method. So, um, uh, so it's all visualized in square foot. So this is for a four by four garden. So you have 16 square feet. Each square feet, um, depending on the size of the veggie, 
you um, plant either one per square foot for something large like strawberries or four per square foot for something smaller like Thai basil. Um, it goes all the way up to nine per square foot for um, Swiss chard and 16 per square foot for carrots. So um, in that kind of planting video example that I gave you guys, um, when you're kind of transferring the plan to the actual garden, it's just a matter of spacing within the square foot um, through holes and then either planting several seeds per hole or planting um, seedlings per kind of um, hole that you made. So the videos are there to kind of guide you through that process. So that's kind of what the um, square foot gardening looks like. And that uh, square foot gardening video that I um, mentioned to you guys before is in Veggie Videos Foundations. And then Grow Big and Small Spaces. So that might give you a kind of bit more information about the square foot gardening method. Um, other things to uh, note on here that will be showing up is just also events. If you want to um, come in person, learn more about gardening, we're going to have uh, Thursday workshops. We'll be having some growing parties throughout the season. So calendar of events here um, of what's kind of going on at Project Garden and within the gardening community. So um, the basic idea is if you kind of want it to take the guesswork out of what to grow and when, um, go to the Project Garden website. The plans are waiting for you there. Plant up um, along with us and then follow along the videos from planting to plate. So I'm just going to pause there and check in with you guys and see um, if there's any questions. You can probably unshare your screen now. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. You're all back. Um, okay. Those are super helpful resources. Very valuable to also have. Um, yeah, what goes, what plants well together, having those companion plants as well. Yeah, and uh, the other thing to consider, the big thing to consider for school gardens is that we um, are lucky enough to be able to grow year round most years unless we get snow like this year so um a good way to think about it is um in seasonal so um think of uh just what well, like there are distinct spring vegetables um that prefer cool weather you can plant really early get off to a good start and be done by the time you guys are out of school at the end of june and you can actually plant a cover crop through the summer. If nobody's around to maintain during the summer, you can plant a cover crop during the summer and that just will enrich your soil and uh, prevent weeds from coming in while it sits empty. Then when you come back in the fall, you can plant a fall and winter garden um, uh, that will go all the way until March. So you can actually skip out on what we normally consider the growing season, which is the summer, or you can plant um, some vegetables that have a longer harvest period that will pop back up in September when you guys are back and will be ready waiting for you. So um, uh, the project garden plans that I've put together are seasonal. So the ones that, um, as we launch the website next week, the ones that you'll see on the website are our spring plans. So those are the ones that you want to be considering and looking at those vegetables. Um, if you don't want to do the exact plan, those vegetables are all ones that will grow really well. So yeah, I'm going to just pause and take your questions around um, kind of that resource. Maybe you have some more questions about square foot gardening. For a fall and winter garden, if we do not have a greenhouse, that's from Chantel. So um, kind of your cool weather crops are um, your leafy greens. So arugula, lettuce, spinach, um, your uh, peas are a good one. Radish are another good one. 
Now, and then your brassicas are your most hearty vegetables. So brassicas include kale, broccoli, um, cauliflower, collards, all of those guys can withstand even frost. So, um, so, th you, so it's good to think about fall gardens kind of in two pieces quick growing crops that um, you can plant and you'll be ready to harvest by the time it gets cold in November. So radish, your leafy greens, etc. And then really hardy crops like your um, brassicas that will go throughout the winter, even in frost and will be okay. And then, then we have some really fun ones, which fall, winter is actually the time of year for them. And that's garlic. Um, so garlic you plant in November and um, it comes all and then you harvest it in um, July. So it takes up a lot of space, but it's um, a, a really fun one to kind of garden with. And then another great idea is broad beans. So broad beans you plant in November as well. They'll go through the winter and um, uh, develop with these lovely flowers in the spring. And they're actually a cover crop. So they're enriching your soil um, throughout the winter, again, instead of letting it sit empty and preventing those weeds from happening. So those are some really fun kind of fall and winter ones. And on that note, I'd like to just um, share with you guys a great resource around timing and timing of the year and especially fall and winter gardens. So I'm gonna just show you on the share screen first and then I'll provide you with the links. Would you recommend any um, herbs as well throughout the winter? Like I know rosemary yeah. and perennials kind of will last throughout. Totally, yeah. So um, perennials are a great option. Um, a perennial herb garden just both for maintenance um, for cost, you plant them once and they're, um, uh, they'll last for three years plus. Um, and you don't have to replace, replant or anything like that. You get a lot of bang for your buck. A small thing of um, herbs can provide, you know, a cafeteria worth, worth of um, flavor. And then as you mentioned, yeah, because they are perennial, they'll last either through the winter or longer into the season and start back up earlier than you would um, be able to plant some of your veggies. And then there's specific kind of really great ones for the winter or cool season. So we talked about garlic. Another um, really good one is cilantro. So actually it doesn't like this, the heat of the summer. So you really only want to be planting it in the spring or the early fall um, so that uh, you actually get to harvest it before it goes to seed. Um, other really good um, fall winter herbs are parsley and green onions. Those ones are also prefer the cool weather. So, and those ones that are actually quite nice because they do tolerate the um, heat of the summer as well. So I almost consider them a year round um, option as well. So I'll just share the screen and um, show you the resources that I was talking about. So uh, West Coast Seeds puts together kind of the ultimate planting guide for um, us here on the West Coast and other areas of BC and the country. And specifically, they have this um, uh, planting guide. It's available on their website. I'll share the link. It's also available in nurseries um, all over the place. But here they've put together dates of um, fall and winter harvest kind of planting chart. So this gives you a, a really good idea of when kind of um, things need to go into the ground and what vegetables you can con consider through the winter. So um, there's that. They also just have um, the chart on its own available to print out on the website as well. So I will, I'm just going to share those links with you guys. Okay, so here's the West Coast Seeds planting guide links. So uh, this is their regular gardening guide for, it does kind of the full, full year round. This is their specific 
um, winter gardening guide. There had a plant charts that just um, single page printouts um, that I showed you guys. And they have also on their website how to grow guides. So if you want to know something in particular about a uh, specific veggie, this is where you can go as well. So I'm just going to, yeah, take any quest other questions that you guys have, Addie or Chantal, about um, Project Garden and kind of educational resources and planning. This looks amazing. I'm so glad this is all put together. Yeah. A great awesome. job. I do need to run, but um, thank you so much, Carissa, and thank you, Sam, for hosting. Absolutely. Yeah, I look forward to seeing the big launch and sharing it. Amazing. Okay, well, ho hopefully talk to you soon. Yes, for sure. Thanks, Carissa. Bye. So, Chantal, um, since you're still there, I guess I'll just break and see if you have any questions um, before we go to kind of the last piece of the, of the presentation. Awesome. Okay, so let's um, move on to the next piece, I guess. So um, education, how do you actually then, okay, so you have your school garden growing, you've got your infrastructure in place, you have your plan of what you're going to grow, when you're going to plant it. So next step then is, um, how are you going to teach on it? So um, I'm going to just share a couple of great resources. So around curriculum planning with you here. So the Spec School Gardens program, they have an awesome resource up there um, of that integrates with the curriculum and uh, Sam was uh, helpful enough to share this um, resource as well. They have a great video um, around kind of um, planning and they also have workshops in, per in person uh, for teachers around um, yeah, how to integrate it into your curriculum. Now if you're kind of thinking, hmm, we, um, uh, for us, the real issue is, you know, time and um, uh, how are we going to kind of integrate this um, into the curriculum and are looking for a little bit of outside help. We are very lucky in BC to have some amazing um, educators that will go into the classroom and kind of take care of these pieces for you of um, around teaching and it can be kind of fun for students to get some new people into the um, school. So I just like to share those resources here. So in school educators, there's Sprouting Chefs, Growing Chefs and Project Chef. And the three organizations really teach that um, concept of plant to plate. So each of them will show you first how to grow and then go all the way to then how do you use this in the classroom. And kind of for kids to see that full progression is so incredible. So I highly recommend and support the work that they're doing and encourage you to reach out to them and see how they can um, help you kind of with your schoolyard project. The other um, resource I shared here, there's two other ones, the City Farmer. So they do specifically worm composting in the classroom. Um, so if that's something you'd like to kind of work into your curriculum plans, um, uh, you're thinking, oh, why don't we create our own compost if we have the schoolyard program? Like I said, their um, kits, their worm composters are subsidized. They're um, meant for classroom and they'll do education um, for that within the classroom, I think, um, for you as well. And then finally, the Classroom Gardener is kind of a new program starting up, and they um, really uh, have integrated the curriculum planning into the gardening um, aspect so that actually uh, the garden has lesson plans for all subject matters. So it's really a 
um, holistic way of thinking about the schoolyard um, program within the classroom. So I would also highly recommend them. And then finally, if you um, uh, are kind of feel okay to um, do some of the planning yourself and are going to do the teaching yourself, uh, another um, resource for fun it, that does field trips is um, Garden Works, and they do workshops and tours through their garden center um, and can kind of maybe take that next level of education if you're um, looking to go there with a class. At the um, Garden Works Low Heat location, we have a learning garden, Project Garden has a learning garden in the back, um, which is where part of where the tour goes through. And that's also where I'm there every Thursday throughout the growing season for you guys to stop in, ask any questions that you have. So um, if you're looking for that in-person kind of resource and connection, that's where you can find me. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, do you have any questions about that, Chantal? This is, this is an amazing list, Carissa, and uh, to, to add to some of these, um, Farm to School has some additional uh, contacts with um, groups that come into the classroom. Uh, Lori Snyder is a Métis herbalist and educator who comes into the classroom to teach about Indigenous food systems and uh, Earth and Co is her company and so um, she works in the Vancouver area and then there's also... Um, I've attended her workshops too and they are amazing so I would yeah. definitely second that recommendation. Yeah, and uh, there's there's a few people who specialize in bees uh, and uh, apiculture is that's the right terminology. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's there's quite a few more. Um, and we actually did a, our first farm to school webinar in September or October was based on farm to school in the curriculum, and so we had Niku from Spec. Um, talk about how she integrates farm to school in an elementary um, curriculum and then we had Roz uh, Sadowski of Fresh Roots and they have schoolyard farms and yeah. she was talking about how to integrate it into the high school curriculum. So um, so all of these resources I'm going to be posting on one big list, accessible list on our website uh, including this video. So yeah I just want to say thank you. This is an amazing compilation. Perfect. Um, I have kind of one thing that I'd like to end with, um, uh, talking about resources. So um, where do you actually kind of get then the plants and the seeds to grow? If you have your infrastructure in place, you kind of know what you want to grow, then um, uh, there's people out here to help you. So um, two of kind of the Project Garden partners um, offer uh so i'm just trying to post them here the link okay um so west coast seeds have a seed donation program the link is here to apply for it um they what they do with schools and nonprofits is they donate last year's seed um for free for um programming so they are an incredible company their seeds are amazing and a really good way to kind of get started they also have a fundraising program so um, they'll provide seeds to you um, and I think it's at 40% off cost you resell them at full price and keep kind of the profits so if that's something that you're if you were for example looking to raise money for setting up the garden to begin with that's another option that kind of ties into it it gets people's kind of um, talking about it and um, and uh, being able to contribute towards it so yeah they have those two great programs and then tried and true they um, grow organic seedlings um, and they have a contest up right now it's called the growing gardener school garden contest so it's a photo contest um, but the winners of that receive um, a school their pick of kind of uh, school organic seedlings for their schoolyard pro program as well. And then um, I just like to uh, invite you to continue fo following along with um, Project Garden as we kind of uh, get that going as well 
um, a, a big part of what we'll be doing is something called impact gardens. So I'll just let you kind of uh, follow along and see exactly what that's going to mean. <laughs> it looks like Chantelle had one question about how much the Garden Works trip is. I'm not actually sure what uh, they charge for that, but I do know that it's um, very reasonable. So I'd uh, definitely encourage you to reach out to them at that link that I provided and they'll um, be able to give you that info. And there's other um, field trip options as well in the Vancouver area. Uh, I know uh, UBC Botanical Gardens, um, the UBC farm as well uh, and Southlands farm all offer kind of some some field trip programming for schools. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Jessica and are feeling awesome. You have to go. Okay, um, perfect. Thank you so much for joining us Chantel and Jessica and uh, I wish you all the best with your school garden planning and please feel free to reach out with any other questions that you have. Thank you so much, Krista, for everything. Um, I'm going to post all of this on the Farm to School website, and it'll be up on our uh, social media. So stay in touch. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.